each of the public healings of Jesus have within them a demonstration of a certain science of the sacred fire which is the science of the mother. Healing is the science of wholeness that comes out of the white fire core and in earth that white fire core is mother in the great central sun it is alpha and omega in the white fire core of being. So in order for the fullness of the great trinity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to manifest, we must be about the study of the science of the Mother and her manifestation within us. Our healing services at the Ashram of the World Mother are consecrated to this study and its practical demonstration as each Wednesday night we gather for intense dynamic decrees for the city of Los Angeles, for the seat of the soul chakra of America, so that the soul, which is the reflecting pool, wherein the image of the Christ is intended to be reflected, may reflect to all of the chakras of the earth, all of the cities, all of the citadels of consciousness, the image immaculate. We have in Los Angeles every form of opposition to the freedom of the soul upon earth. There is no evil upon the face of the earth that you cannot find in embryo or in full-fledged manifestation in the county of Los Angeles. And there is no light so great manifest in all the earth that it cannot be found in this seat of the soul chakra. And so Wednesday evenings are dedicated to that great calling that we have from the ancient of days who called us to be kings and priests unto God. That calling is the manifestation of the city four square. And the way the city four square manifests is by the healing light of wholeness. The key to that healing is in the statement, and the leaves of the tree shall be for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree are the virtues of your causal body. Your tree of life is your mighty I am presence. The heart of the tree is the living Christ. And the soul becoming one with that heart is the increase of that tree. The increase then is manifest in the beauty of the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the leaves of the tree, the abundant life. So when you begin to manifest the wholeness of the mother, you have a storehouse of virtue. You have a momentum of light, and by the science of the mother, you call it forth. It descends through the Trinity to manifest in the threefold flame in your heart. When you meditate on the threefold flame, when you give the violet flame to transmute what is in the subconscious, you are increasing the size of the focus of the Trinity in your heart. The greater the balance, the greater the intensity of that threefold flame, the greater it is a magnet of the central sun. What is the magnet of the central sun? It is a magnet of the Christ consciousness, the personal Christ of Jesus, the personal Christ of you, the cosmic Christ of Lord Maitreya. That magnetizes the light of the Father. The great central sun magnet is universal Christ consciousness pulling into manifestation the light of the I am that I am. This is why Paul said that God has given to us the gift of the sun dwelling in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, crying unto the Lord, Father, the name of Father, the name of God, I am that I am. It is the office of the Christ in you to call upon the name of the Lord, I am that I am, day and night. And this calling upon the name of the Lord results in the increase of the sacred fire of the Trinity in your heart. Hence, the threefold flame of the Trinity is both the instrument for the magnetization of the light of God by your Christ self, and it is the manifestation of your Christ self. The sacred fire, threefold flame, is always both person of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and principle. 
So the person of the Trinity is in your heart and the officiating person is always the Son, the Christ Self, magnetizing the full light of the I Am Presence. So healing always begins with a meditation upon the heart. The heart becomes the magnet. It magnetizes the light of the Father above and the light of the Mother from below. It magnetizes the rising of the sacred fire of the Kundalini and the descent of the Lord from heaven. And so the ascending, descending currents of Almighty God coalesce in the heart, and there is the sign of the six-pointed star. And everyone who has the action and the movement of this fire has that very image of the six-pointed star of David superimposed in the heart. It is there, it can be seen, and it is a powerful energy. It means the energy of mother is rising, building the pyramid, the fiery coil of the ascension. It means the energy of the father is descending to catch the soul as the bride of Christ and carry that soul in the rapture, in the air, in the ascension. Light of the father descending is for the materialization of the God flame in earth. When the light of your I am presence descends and unites with the rising mother flame, you have precipitation. Precipitation of what? The leaves of your tree of life. That is what you can precipitate. You can't make something out of nothing. And so the something that you make out of something is that the lawful elements of precipitation are locked within your very causal body of light. That causal body is yours. You have built it line upon line by your words, feelings, thoughts, actions, and deeds. Have you ever had the experience of going to the bank, coming with your passbook and saying, I'd like to withdraw the contents of my savings account and have the banker say to you, sorry, the bank is closed today and you can't take out your money. In fact, it's permanently closed and you'll never get your money out. Well, of course, that is what happens when there's a run on the banks, when we have what happened in 1929 in the 30s. Well, can you imagine going to your cosmic bank account and going there with your Christ self and asking for your light and energy, asking to withdraw it? And the question is given, why do you want to withdraw your light? Because I want to serve mankind and save the earth and increase light on earth. And then the question is asked, what is your capacity to guard the light? What is your capacity to reinforce that light and see that it is not abused? If you answer all things properly, then the guardian, the great keeper of life, the mighty I am presence, releases the treasures in your bank account and they manifest as abundance upon earth. Well, God really never says no, you can't take out of the bank what you have put in it. It's lawfully yours, it belongs to you. But God sets laws in motion for the protection of your investment. Like a wise father, he does not let a foolhardy son or child spend the momentous energy of that trust, that trust in heaven. And so the trust of energy is guarded well, guarded by the I am presence, the four cosmic forces, and you find yourself abiding in earth and you wonder why you are not living in abundance, not so much abundance of riches, which seems to be the easiest portion of abundance to come by, but the abundance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the abundance of wisdom, of perception of the great mysteries, a greater abundance of love, all of the virtues that we long to see manifest and instead often see the greatest counterpart of their opposition because those are the things that are on the surface in time and space as our souls work out the law of karma. So we are heirs of the vast wealth and storehouse of our causal body and sometimes we look like beggars, sometimes we look as though we are the most impoverished when we are the most wealthy of people of the universe because we have accepted our joint heirship. The problem of healing the nations then, of coming together on Wednesday evenings for the precipitation of the city four square, is to discern step by step why those leaves of those, that tree of life cannot be precipitated in matter and why all of the things that we desire to see come to pass are not manifesting. 
the well, the leaves of the tree can only manifest in one place. They manifest in seven chalices, the chakras of being. And each chakra is a repository for the light of one of the spheres of your causal body. Now the keeper, the Lord who is thy keeper, day and night, will not allow you to extract from the fiery core the white flame of your causal body, the full intensity of the momentum of attainment of the white light, or the full intensity of God himself, and place this in the base of the spine chakra until that chakra is purified and cleared. So the path of initiation for those who would be healers and those who would be whole, beginning with the heart chakra, the point of love, is to clear the chakras, to go in and dig out all of that substance, put it through the flame, and then expand those receptacles. We expand the receptacles by exercises, exercises of service, surrender, sacrifice, selflessness on the path of the ruby ray, exercises of meditation, dynamic decrees, the science of the word. So you know when you go to tear down a house that is half burned down or that is no longer adequate, or you go out and you want to clear up 50 years of accumulation of things when a loved one is passed on, and you put on your old clothes and you go in to dig away at the debris and clear it away, it seems like you're never going to see the beginning or the ending of the process. To walk away from it and sit on a mountaintop and meditate is so much easier, so much more joyous and pleasant, and so it is with a path. The path of discipleship means to be willing to go out with Hercules and clean out the Aegean stables, clean them out thoroughly, and to not become discouraged midpoint of that operation. It's an operation of Christ command. We must go into these seven chakras. We must clear the sewer of substance that is collected around them and clog them. And at the midpoint, when we're covered with that energy and that soot and that substance and wrestling with a carnal mind that has invaded those chalices, we can't give up and walk away and say, I'm going to find a better guru and an easier path. That is when we have to work all the harder and we have to understand the science that is involved in what we are doing. It is a process of clearing the chalices, making them crystal clear for precipitation. Maria Montessori found out that little children like the ritual of cleaning. And I can remember when I was a child, I used to love to clean and scrub and rake and do all sorts of physical things that were a ritual of preparation of things to come. Whether it was gardening or cleaning or whatever it was doing, it was the sense, I'm preparing for a very important moment. Something is going to happen. Father and mother will come home, the house will be ready, the supper will be ready, or the garden will be ready for the planting. But it was that sense of preparation and that joyous expectancy, and as one matures spiritually, one realizes that those preparations were for the coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the fullness of the Christ self, willing to dwell bodily within us because our chalices are cleared. These are the first steps of healing, we must not weary in well-doing. We've built up the debris for more than a quarter of a million years. Now we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the violet flame can be the most stupendous agent for the alchemy of healing, and you must not overlook it or forget it. The violet flame is an active part of everyone's vigil of healing, no matter what the cause and core of the condition, no matter what an individual is going through. So whatever ring it is of your causal body, if you can't seem to get those leaves down, if you can't seem to intensify the vision of the city four square through the third eye or the mind of God through the crown or adeptship in the authority of the word in the throat chakra, clean them out. Roll up your sleeves. Go in. Go in with intense calls. Demand the binding of every last demon discarnate, force field of witchcraft, record of death, fear and doubt, anxiety. Let them be stripped and do it by the ruby ray. Sanat Kumara gave us this great dispensation of the ruby ray, has taught us how to use it. It is a stupendous action. So the clearing of the chakras, the increase of the magnet of the heart, increasing the light in your temple. After all, when God sends a real current of healing 
through you for the healing of yourself and others, there must be enough light that can take a greater light. You have to have enough charge of the Godhead in you that a supercharge can be passed through you without knocking you out because you're so dense. So there has to be light in you for light to pass through you for you to be an electrode of energy. Wednesday night then is the night that we celebrate this precipitation of the light of our causal body into the city four square. Wherever you are, you are first healing the souls of the planetary body, of all their diseases, the records in the etheric plane, the devious manifestations implanted by the serpent in the mind, all of the collective unconscious and the lunar energies, the divisions that go back into the depths of the astral body, and finally the deformations of the physical body. We tackle this city by city and nation by nation because Jesus Christ did not say the leaves of the tree are for the healing of your pet physical problems or your personal desires for a cosmetic perfecting of your outer form. Jesus had the tremendous vision of the power of God, the power of the one. The power of the one can become the power of 10 billion times 10 billion. If you can heal one person, one level of consciousness, the whole planet can be healed simultaneously. And we have to consider the selfishness of confining prayers for one sick person or one loved one or one enormous problem in our lives that has gotten all out of proportion when in fact people are dying, people are hungry, and all kinds of manipulations are being carried on. So for the healing of the nations, to me, contained in that phrase is the entire knowledge of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ of binding the adversary, extracting that adversary just like a surgeon. Jesus Christ is the master surgeon. I have seen Jesus Christ stand over people and go into their subconscious with angels of Raphael's band looking just like they were nurses in attendance in an operating room. And they would deftly go into the subconscious and very carefully, with healing light and actual instruments, remove the tentacles of a cancer boring its way into the subconscious. Not physical at all, but an astral cancer, a mental ca cancer, approaching the seat of the soul chakra to the very endangerment of the life of that soul. The ascended masters have a very advanced art and science of the removal of these pockets within the subconscious. So when we pray for healing, we must see the great wisdom of praying for the healing masters and the master surgeon Jesus Christ and all who serve with him to go into the collective unconscious of the people and the nations, to go into the collective unconscious and the individual subconscious of individuals to remove these forces Unless they are removed, they dominate what will manifest in the physical plane. The physical plane is mere effect. And all attempts to heal merely in the physical plane are stop-gap measures. Sometimes stop-gap measures are necessary. Sometimes it's important to take medicine and physical remedies to allay a physical condition, to buy time to work on the inner levels for the healing of the astral, mental, and etheric body. The ascended masters would not have you impractical. They have inspired MDs as well as chiropractors and naturopaths and homeopaths and all kinds of people who may have an understanding of health. None of these professions is barred. It is not the profession but the individual. And there are souls of great light in all of these areas and there are souls who are psychic in these areas. And so we must realize that to keep the physical body well is a science in itself. And that must go on while we work with the deeper problems. Now you have heard where doctors physically will look at a condition and they cannot perform the whole surgery in one operation. The heart may not be able to stand it or some other organ. And so they will only do a partial operation and take it up again in six months or a year 
or they may say this individual cannot stand the surgery that is required and give that person up. Well, I can assure you that each one of us has conditions in the subconscious that may pollute the stream of the mind and we may call for healing and the ascended masters cannot by cosmic law remove the entire cause and core of the condition at subconscious levels because that condition is so intertwined and I can only liken it to a tumor. Sometimes you will see a brain tumor that is so involved in the brain that to try to remove it would be to destroy the brain itself. And those conditions are present on the astral plane in the astral body. And therefore, they cannot be removed surgically by a one-time call to the Great White Brotherhood. But they are removed by the Holy Ghost, sacred fire, the process of transmutation, goes in and consumes the cause and core of it day by day, little by little, because all of the four lower bodies must adjust to the removal of that substance, to the burning heat, to all kinds of side effects in the four lower bodies and the chakras, and to the individual's own adjustment to the loss of a state of consciousness or a condition of being that he has become accustomed to as a part of his self-identity. Many people have substance in the mental body that they would not define as the adversary. It might be a very subtle energy of greed or gluttony or self-indulgence, which by the standard of the world would not seem too great. And that individual may abound in other virtues and might be overindulgent of this little subtle stream. And so he might be overprotective of it. He would not realize that that is the very substance that may be causing a perpetual problem of asthma or some other chronic condition that he lives with and limps along with but is not fatal. So the little bit of greed is not fatal, nor is the condition fatal, but it seems to persist. And people don't understand why they don't get over it. Well, tolerance in the astral or mental body may produce a lingering condition in the physical body. So when it comes to the removal of that entire stream, you can see that if an ascended master were to answer your call to remove the cause and core of that condition, and it were done in an instant, Number one, you would not have gained the mastery over it. It might be gone from you, but you might recreate it because, first of all, you didn't see any harm in it in the first place, and secondly, you didn't have the mastery over it. The other situation is it would so be involved in one's human identity that one would miss that condition. One might miss uh, a regular Friday night or Saturday night activity, maybe bowling, maybe a beer party, maybe this or that or the next thing that seems harmless if one puts in a week-long uh, uh, vigil of sacrifice and giving of oneself. Well, <clears throat> whatever it might be, if it were suddenly removed, a portion of one's identity would be removed before it would have been transmuted by the free will of the individual saying and looking at himself, now I really would rather be doing something more important for the Lord than what I've been spending my Saturday nights doing for the last 25 years, even though that may be harmless. So the individual elects to put on more of the identity of the Christ. As he does so, he makes a decision to make himself one with that Christ self and therefore the substance can be cut off, snipped off with surgical scissors and burned up by the violet consuming flame and by the ruby ray. But until one has determined to separate oneself from a limited identity and consciousness, it just not, does not happen that Archangel Gabriel or Archangel Raphael or Archangel Michael will come in and dissolve it because you would be left with less portion of your human ego to surrender. Your human ego needs to be there to have something to put on the altar when you decide to surrender it. And if somebody comes along and dissolves it before you surrender it, what are you going to give in exchange for the Christ self?
you've got to give up that portion of your human ego and understand that although it was a very nice human ego and a very good human ego, you still want something better and you're making the thrust of energy to get that something better. Then comes this influx of the Holy Ghost through the Christ self. There is an acceleration of being. You have the new person in you, which is your own identity, your Christ self, and you can look back on your former self and former activities. You suffer no loss. You suffer no loss whatsoever. You yourself can take the old planks of identity and throw them into the, into the flame and have no fear that something that was really you was being taken from you before you were ready. So whatever you may be facing in your consciousness today of limitation for which you are calling healing, you must be willing to start from the point of where you are now, who you are. And you must be willing to say, if I am still manifesting incompleteness, it is because there are elements in my being that I have not yet consciously put through the sacred fire and been willing to be separated from. Now, God is very merciful to his children. He doesn't rush us. He doesn't push us. He has given us, after all, perhaps a million years to decide to make that simple exchange of the human ego for the divine ego. He's allowed us to go through all kinds of situations, family life, karma, this civilization, that civilization, and every lesson we've ever learned has been to point us to the place we have a real identity, and if we really want to manifest that real identity, we can make the exchange point by point until there's none of the lesser left and the greater self is manifesting its wholeness. Now, since we've been around and going through this process for so long, we realize there is an acceleration. We sense that there is a certain imminence of the descent of the Godhead in us, and we sense that it is important to make decisions today because it is the end of an age, not merely the Piscean age, but a long age of our being on earth with Sanat Kumara. By a like token, we are ready. Because we are ready, the fullness of the science is here. So I bid you to be calm. I bid you to look and be objective with the conditions in yourself that you are desirous of transmuting. I bid you be patient, follow to the best of your ability the balanced understanding of diet, health, exercise, yoga, meditation, and the balance of the yin and yang of going within the heart and coming without. The whole balance of living the life of Alpha and Omega. Walk straight toward the mark of your mighty I Am Presence. Desire your mighty I Am Presence more than you desire healing, and you will be healed. You must love God more than you love or want that healing. Now, with that spoken, I would like to give to you the next in the healings of Jesus. I have taken up the first of these healings in my Wednesday night meetings, and they are available on cassette. The instruction of Jesus' healings from his very first one. The one I am taking today is recorded in the book of John. Chapter 5. It is a tremendously important experience, and we have a great deal to learn about the science of the mother from Jesus. It was the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost before, of course, the actual Pentecost in the book of Acts. It was a Jewish feast, and it was on that occasion of that feast that this healing took place at the pool of Bethesda. And so John writes, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went up. He went up or accelerated in to the cube of the mother, 
The name Jerusalem is the force field of the mother, the biding place of Jesus. He went to Jerusalem as the chakra of the earth that had to be healed by his causal body and where the fallen ones had to be cast out. This miracle could have been performed anywhere, but it had to be performed in Jerusalem. Your miracles must be performed in the cube four square. The meaning of the cube in your heart that is the sign that you are a communicant of church universal and triumphant means that you have within you a replica of Jerusalem, the cube, the white cube of the mother. When you go forth to heal, you must go up into it. You must accelerate your consciousness into the white light. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. We who made the trip to Jerusalem stood at that pool where this healing took place. The pool is the symbol of the seat of the soul chakra. The seat of the soul chakra is the mirror of the Christ. It is positioned between the solar plexus and the base of the spine there as a reflecting mirror. If the pool is smooth and clear, it reflects the fullness of the image of the Christ. We are made in the image of the Christ. If our soul be purified, the fullness of the Christ self shall be reflected in the soul. And the soul, being the image of the Christ, will be the fullness of that manifest Christ. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. You might say that this pool is symbolical of the very soul of Jesus Christ, where the sick, the infirm, are gathered, gathered and waiting for the angel of healing to come. So when your seat of the soul chakra is cleared, as was the soul chakra of the Son of God, and he is the reflecting pool of the fullness of the Christ, then all the multitudes may come, and by the mere touching of the reflection of the Christ, as the touching of the hem of the garment, they may be healed by the manifest person of the Christ. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So the angel of the Lord, the angel of the blessed presence of Jesus Christ, could very well have been Archangel Raphael, would come and touch the water. Touching the water, the water would be supercharged with the light of the mighty I am presence. And the soul being the negative polarity of the positive polarity, the soul touching it would immediately absorb that light because it was a polarity action. Spirit charge rushes in and fills the negative empty soul. So there they sat waiting for the moving of the water. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? Jesus perceived a question of the will. He had been in, infirm thirty eight years. It becomes a question of the will. Are you willing to receive the wholeness of Alpha and Omega in your temple? Are you willing to receive that sacred fire that will realign your atoms and electrons and transmute the karma? The transmutation of the karma is always by the grace of the person of the Christ. Jesus Christ bore our infirmities. He was the guru who took on karma. As he took on that karma, the descent of the I am presence was complete and the individual was made whole. Both processes had to take place. A person of God incarnate being willing to bear the substance untransmuted. 
Taking that away then, the chalice could be filled with the wholeness of Alpha and Omega. So the Son was the mediator of the Father. This is the understanding of mediator, bearing the infirmities. When you pray for healing, you may be required to do this, but you are not allowed to do it unless it is in accord with the lineage of the descent of your guru, which is Sanat Kumara, Gautama Buddha, Lord Maitreya, Jesus Christ, all serving with them through the two witnesses. If it is not lawful for me to take on an individual's karma, it is not lawful for you. How do you avoid so doing? You always call to the will of God. And you say, let this karma be set aside, let it be borne by the chain of hierarchy, if it be the will of God. And if it be not the will of God, then let it remain and let the individual be enlightened as to the process of transmutation himself. That is very important. Because if you unlawfully take on karma, then you have the karma of taking it on plus the karma of itself. It is a karma for adding burden to the weight of the sangha of the guru and chilas upon the planetary body. Now Jesus taught every man must bear his own burden except for the intercession of the Son of God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother. Without that intercession, every individual bears his own karma. <clears throat> so here is the great question. Are you willing to be made whole? This is the initiation of the five porches, the five initiatic inner rays of Alpha and Omega. It's the real initiation of Pentecost. And when it came time for the translation of that Jewish feast after the ascension of Jesus, and they were all together in one place on the day of Pentecost, it was their willingness to receive the whole eye spirit, the whole eye of God, that enabled them to receive it. They were ready. They were the disciplined ones. They were obedient. They were tarrying in the city of Jerusalem to be endued with power from on high, and they did not fear that power. Jesus is asking this man, are you going to be content not to have this infirmity? Thirty and eight years you have been infirm, you've had pity from people, you've not had to work, your whole life has been geared around this infirmity. Are you willing to be whole and to bear the responsibilities of wholeness? Every doctor today knows that many people use their illnesses to control others, and when it really comes down to it, they want to be pampered in their illnesses, but not be cured. Now, Jesus knew the heart of this man. He knew his willingness, but he asked the question for the record, because the record is for you and for me to study. And we have to know what is the condition of healing. The condition of healing is willingness to bear the responsibility of wholeness. Why, look at all the things you can get out of when you're limited, physically, mentally, or emotionally. I mean, just having a limited mind means you don't have to work so hard, you don't have to have a profession of responsibility, you can do routine work, so you don't have to think, you don't have to take responsibility for others. I mean, what would some people do if their minds were healed and suddenly they had the fullness of the mind of Christ? Would they be content or would they rather go back to the point of being like a rock, dull and therefore incapable and therefore not having to bear responsibilities? So it goes with all of the four lower bodies. There is a responsibility that comes with wholeness and it's the service of God night and day. Now that should be on your notebooks if you are seeking any form of healing, wilt thou be made whole? Can you bear the responsibility of wholeness? Here is his answer. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Well, Jesus saw through that, and he knew it was somewhat of an excuse. It was an excuse to continue to be unhealed, wasn't it? He could be there another 38 years 
and each time someone else would beat him to the pool. And so he was looking to that pool and that angel for his healing rather than the realization that it is the Christ by which we are healed and the Christ within us. Well, you can't blame him too hard because the full message of salvation through the living Savior had not even been preached to him. And yet the message was there in the life of Elijah and Elisha and all of their mighty miracles. So for him, the only healing that would come to him was if he could get there first. Jesus answered him. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. He said, Rise. He was making him accelerate in the light of the mother, the white light. Take up thy bed. Carry your own karma. Don't lie down upon it. Pick up your karma and carry it. And walk. Three commands. Accelerate in the light of the mother so that you can take up your karma and then walk. Those three commands had embodied within them in the spoken word the full power and authority of Jesus' attainment in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Rise is the action of the power of the Father principle in Jesus' heart. Take up thy bed the power of the Son to bear karma. Walk the action of the Holy Spirit. Three commands, fulfill the Trinity, and you will be made whole by the mother light. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now the great glory of this experience, insofar as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned, is that after all of his incarnations, his embodiment as David, the mistakes that he made, the burdens of Israel, the psalms of lamentation, which are filled with a confrontation with his enemies, the seed of the wicked. After all he had been through, he gets to live this glorious final incarnation when he may be the crystal clear soul, where he may be the reflecting pool, where multitudes may be healed that he can give the command with authority and transfer the action of the threefold flame and make it possible for the soul who is willing to bear the responsibility of wholeness to rise, take up his bed, and walk. And the ability of that man to do that was transferred by the spoken word, the voice of Jesus Christ speaking this, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk was the transfer from the heart chakra of that full God attainment coming as the authority of the word. Whenever you speak, coming through that throat chakra is the opposite of the throat chakra, which is the solar plexus, the desire body. For the word to carry healing and wholeness, the desire body must be pure and purified. It must be charged with the light of the mother. Subconscious patterns must either be transmuted or sealed over with light by you in your daily decrees so that the substance of your karma that is daily being transmuted is not an interference with the conveyance of the word. In other words, you do not have to have balanced all your karma to be the instrument of healing but you must daily be meeting the demands of that karma by sacred fire invocations and if each day you have transmuted all that the law will allow you to transmute on that day the rest of your karma is sealed and it will be bypassed so whenever you speak the contents of your desire body is vibrating in your word. This is why we get very edgy when we hear people speaking that have funny voices or shrill voices or dishonest voices or manipulative voices or voices that indicate they are, that they are not even attached to the Christ self. And we go a great deal by voice 
in this society and so it is true that the seed of the wicked go to great lengths to train their voices to sound the way they should sound radio personalities TV personalities they all talk the same way because they know what sound is necessary to convince the people so there is a simulation of the voice of the true shepherd by those who are in the industry today so the voice carries the full contents of the desire body and so if the desire be impure the command will be impure the command will not then be able to carry the momentum of your Christ self and your I am presence for healing so what do you do daily when you decree for sometimes several hours you are purifying your throat chakra your throat chakras become more and more the crystal stream more and more powerful the authority of your word is far above the authority of the demons that tremble and so it is so the saints are the instruments of the lamb now the true and lawful desire is the desire to be God and each time you see other desires springing up that are unlawful you pluck them out as weeds in the garden put them in the sacred fire and move on and if you can't quite pluck them out you seek help you call on a fellow servant of God you call upon the messenger and you say I have this unlawful desire I want to get rid of this habit help me and the whole community of light bearers goes to work together to help one another root out unlawful desire that is the great strength of community so here is the great joy of Jesus Christ who often would talk with Mark as Mark would relate it to me and speak to him of the great joy and glory of that final incarnation and the final three years that the moments of sorrow and pain were very small and that he was in the fullness of that joy of fulfillment of having gone through the whole process of evolution of having come with Sanat Kumara and finally being at the point when the whole law could be publicly demonstrated so there is a great joy in the person of Jesus Christ in the healing and the joy becomes part of the command rise take up thy bed and walk it's a tremendous joy a tremendous conveyance lo I am here I am come and in me is the fullness of the abundant life and with the conveyance of the command is the conveyance of the realization the works that I do shall ye do also because ye believe in me the Son of God and so it was the Sabbath day here then comes the understanding of having to bind the wicked by the logos of the word by the power of Almighty God in order to be free to heal the children of God on the seventh day of ritual we are living in the 2000 year era of the Sabbath this is the Sabbath 2000 years the Aquarian age is the seventh day it's the day of rest which means the day of recreation of all of the previous six days and who do we hear crying out it is not lawful to heal it is not lawful to raise up the sons and daughters of God it is not lawful to feed them the teachings of Almighty God every condemnation heaped upon the ascended masters and their messenger and their chilas are the same condemnations heaped upon Jesus Christ for healing on the Sabbath and here they are the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured it is the Sabbath day it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed Jews Orthodox Jews are not allowed to carry anything on the Sabbath what they are really saying in the seventh age of Aquarius it is not lawful for you to carry your own individual karma because Jesus Christ died for your sins 2,000 years ago he paid the whole debt it's not lawful for you to believe in karma and reincarnation this is the Sabbath day of rest and they have made it a day of death no life is to be infused in the body of God in the seventh dispensation this is where the two shepherds come forth now they come to repudiate the lie of the manipulators of the seventh ray of Saint Germain 
He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. The soul wasn't going to be caught disobeying the law on his own. He said, Jesus told me to do it. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Your karma has been set aside. The light of the Holy Spirit has come into your temple for wholeness. If you sin again, you will be guilty of misqualifying the great light of Almighty God that has come into your temple. And you will be in abrogation of the covenant with the Son, the mediator, who is carrying your karma. Therefore, a much worse thing will come unto thee, the misqualification of the actual light of Almighty God that is now in your temple. Jesus gave this warning on a number of occasions when he cast out demons or healed. Go and sin no more. He said it to Mary Magdalene. And sometimes he added the additional phrase and sometimes he did not. Lest a worse thing come unto thee. To accept healing from Almighty God, to accept the removal of a bad habit, to go back and sin again, it were better that one had never been healed at all. And many people who are not healed are sick because they are on the second and third round of having already been healed and having misused the light of God that was given to them. And that point of the law comes directly to you from Jesus Christ in this moment. You do not see the past. You do not see the record of those who are not healed. And often it is true because the warning would not have been given had it already not resulted and become the plight of those who did sin against the Holy Spirit. So the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. They were the rulers of the Sabbath, these false priests. And so they said, you will not perform your healings on the Sabbath unless we allow you to do so. You will notice that they did not criticize him for healing, but for healing on the Sabbath day. In other words, for healing without their permission. The watchers in authority always demand that the Christed ones, their chilas, come under their authority. You can have your religion in communist, atheist Russia today as long as you have it under the communist party with communists in the churches. You can have your preachers, teachers, gurus as long as they come under the supervision of the seed of the wicked. And that supervision will come in the form of the media, it may come in the form of a national council of churches or cult watchers or whatever they may be. But the, the combination of the effect, whether it's psychiatrists or whoever else is criticizing this or that charismatic movement is you may not do this unless we pass you as being acceptable and not being a cult leader. And so it is the control of the seed of the wicked of church and state. The owners of the Sabbath, in other words, the owners of freedom and the spirit of freedom in church and state. Now if you will just open your eyes and look around you, you will see these so-called Jews, the fallen ones, in these seats of authority. And they may be Protestant or Catholic or of no religion. The word Jew does not specifically refer to those who are referred to as Jews today. You will look and you will see these individuals in positions of power and you will see their limitation of the expression of recreation in the fires of the seventh age, in the fires of Saint Germain. 
But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He says, The mighty I am presence in me is the working of the works, and when my Father works, I work. I work any day, any hour I please because I do the work of my Father who is in heaven, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of all of the seven rays, and he comes in the fullness of the Holy Ghost when he wills it so. Here is this full power of the Lord Jesus Christ descending as the Holy Ghost even then on that day of Pentecost. And the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Those same fallen ones are about today denying the fact that in the person of Jesus Christ is the guru who can transfer to every one of you full sonship, full joint heirship. And these fallen ones knew exactly what that meant. If you are the son of God, you are equal with God. Why are you equal? Because the son is an equal third of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all God. It's a threefold manifestation of God. So you, the soul, the son of man, become inhabited by the Son of God, the one Son. And that Son of God in you is equal to God the Father, therefore can contain and transmit the work of the Father. If the Son of God in you is not equal with God the Father, then that Son cannot transmit the fullness of that light. And there can be no healing or miracles or wholeness or resurrection or ascension. And therefore the Son of God that comes unto you is equal to the Lord God. And this is the blasphemy denied by the demons. And they tremble as these words are spoken because they hear these words to the uttermost parts of the earth as they heard them when Jesus spoke them. And they tremble because the children of God today know that the Spirit of the Son cries in their heart, Abba, Father. And by confession to that Son, that Son will inhabit them and be the fullness of this power. And so now their anger is manyfold because Jesus Christ is about to reveal the great mystery of Almighty God against which they rebelled in the beginning when Lucifer led them in that rebellion and they refused to bend the knee and bow before the person of the living Christ. And they refused to bow before the living Christ in God's children. And they have refused to do so ever since. And Jesus Christ came to dispel that lie. And when they could not stop him from manifesting the truth, they altered and tampered with the doctrine and dogma so that everyone since has decided that he was the only one that could be the indwelling incarnate son. And no one else could follow that law. They could never deny the sonship of Jesus. Therefore, ever since, they have tried to deny your sonship and your right to be healed or to heal in this Aquarian age. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I and my Father are one, was his great science of being. Here is the science of the mother. You must meditate upon it, give the mantra, I and my Father are one. And instead of trying to be healed or to heal, give the mantra of your oneness with the Father the mantras of purification and watch the work of the Father become your work. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up 
the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. As you listen to these words of Jesus, remember, he probably stood almost no taller than I stand. Slight of figure, the delicate person of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of his strength in the Holy Spirit, faced this entire group of Jews who sought to put him to death. And he preached to them this sermon on the offices of the persons of the Trinity. You see, the original rebellion was this. Luciferians, angels with them, had been with God from the beginning. Almighty God created first the archangels and the angels. He created a whole heaven universe of servants who would be there to worship and adore the manifestation of himself in the person of the Christ, the Son. So the Lord God gives birth to the only begotten Son, the person of the Christ, and he summons all of the celestial hosts to worship, to come and to adore the Son as the manifestation of himself. And Lucifer leads the great rebellion and says, we will not worship the Son. We were here before the Son. We will go directly to the Father without the Son. Jesus Christ knew that he was standing before those very ones who had denied him as that only begotten Son was in him from the beginning. They had to be preached the message in matter that they were preached in spirit. And when they were finally preached that message by the incarnate Son and they would still crucify him by their crucifixion of him, they would face the final judgment before the four and twenty elders and the second death. Whether 2,000 years ago, whether today, Jesus was the instrument of their judgment and the time and the moment of the removal of that seed of the wicked from the planet is known of the Father and of the Son. And so here we see the offices. Jesus makes very plain that if you are going to claim that you represent the Father as you rabbis do, you must accept the Son incarnate. And if you accept the Son then you will have the Father. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. What would you think of people who came to you and praised you and then went out in the backyard and brutally murdered or persecuted your children? while coming to your face and saying, I love you, I love you, but destroyed your children. That is how the father feels about his embodied sons and daughters and his children. He wants the fallen ones and the seed of the wicked to bend that pride, that proudful knee, before the living Christ incarnate. And this is what they will not do. He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. Jesus didn't say, he that heareth my word, and believeth on me. No, he preached no religion of idolatry to his person. He said, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is past 
from death unto life. He is giving them the opportunity to repent and be saved of their wickedness that went to the very foundation of the universe. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. He spoke of himself, Jesus being the Son of Man, filled with a person of the Son of God. When you have that combination, you have the Word incarnate who has the authority to speak the judgment. And that is why you have the judgment call. And when you give it in the name of Jesus Christ, you give it by his authority, by the authority of all the ascended masters. So the Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. If the Son is the one of the Trinity who holds the office of the judgment, then the Father and the Holy Spirit are the ones who execute judgment. So when you make the judgment call, the instruments of the Holy Spirit who execute it are the Elohim and the elemental builders of form. The Father transmits the all power of his judgment through the emissary, the Ancient of Days, and the entire lineage of the hosts of the Lord. <clears throat> All of this Jesus went through for the healing of one soul. Could it be that that soul himself volunteered to be there in that moment, even to become the newspaper, going around and telling everyone that it was Jesus that had healed him, to bring out this anger, this rebellion, this point of the watcher's omnipotence, their attempt to dominate the actions and the words of the Son of God. Clearly, it is another drama, a great drama on the stage, where the simple act of healing becomes the cause of the entire controversy, the head-on collision of the Son of God with the sons of Belial, and he delivers his word, and he delivers the power that puts them down. Well, he is not finished speaking to them. He goes on. And note that he has all also said that the Father loves the Son, showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Jesus is not through with showing the seed of the wicked the full works of God the Father, for that public demonstration of those works will be their judgment. As they react against it, so are they judged. This is the office of the Son of God within you. And from the moment you hear these words until the hour of your transition, you will be called upon to demonstrate the works of God that the wicked may be judged and that the souls of light may be saved. So he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. All of the people in the astral plane, the etheric plane, the mental plane, they all hear the word of the Lamb. They all hear the word of the ascended masters. They all know the word of Saint Germain in this Sabbath day. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. This light of the word that the Father sends forth in me and in you is the flushing out of the whole evolution of the planetary body. And the souls of light will have their resurrection by that word and the souls of the wicked will have their damnation. And what is the meaning of the resurrection of damnation? It means they are flushed out of the astral plane. 
They are forced out of the woodwork. They are lifted out by the power of the resurrection spirit and they stand naked before the sons and daughters of God. And I tell you, the people in embodiment who are the seed of the wicked are becoming more and more naked every day to the people of this nation for the very call of the judgment that is going forth. And the people are seeing through them and through their darkness and their judgment is becoming a public outrage and a claim. Jesus goes on. He's speaking very into the very teeth of these rabbis standing before him knowing that at any moment they could seize him and carry him off. And yet he has no hesitation whatsoever. He is delivering his entire sermon to them just as St. Stephen delivered his sermon. The fullness of the Holy Ghost is upon Jesus Christ. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Why is your judgment just? Because your desire is pure. You seek not your own will in calling forth the judgment. You seek not to be thought powerful or to get even with some adversary. You seek to implement the will of God, whether it is healing or miracles or judgments or service or day-to-day -day life. You have one desire, God's will and not to somehow use God to your own benefit. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So the rebellious ones, they flocked after John the Baptist. They enjoyed his light and the notoriety it brought to them as they use that borrowed light to shine. But I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Now what is the witness of works? The witness of works is the Holy Ghost bearing witness that the Son is indeed come into my temple and your temple. It is the works of the Holy Spirit that surround the community of the Holy Spirit. That is the living witness. And the only one who can truly witness unto the Son of God is the Holy Spirit and the Father. As great as Elijah John the Baptist is, even his witness is not sufficient. He is an ascended master in embodiment, but it's the witness of Almighty God that Jesus claims. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The holy scriptures, which the Sadducees and Pharisees recite as the fundamentalists of the various movements today, those very scriptures testify of the real and living person of Jesus Christ. Yet they search and search those scriptures, and thinking they have eternal life. And they do it to the very present hour and they arrive on the scene of your meetings and they quote those scriptures thinking they have eternal life. And he says, they are they, these Pharisees and Sadducees, the very ones who testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. 
They want the law, the teaching, and the prophets, and even the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ without the living person of the Word incarnate. They will not come where the Word is incarnate in the chilas of the ascended masters. They will not bend the knee to that incarnate light. They will always say, he is not perfect enough, she is not perfect enough, and when she or he will do this, this, and this miracle, then perhaps we will be converted. And always asking for more and more miracles in the very face of the miracles of the Son of God. So the very ones that search the scriptures, affirming the law, thinking they have eternal life, will not come to me that the person of the Son of God might give to them life. I receive not honor from men. We can all agree, can't we? None of us receive honor from men, nor did our master. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. You may not honor me, he said, but I know who you are. You have not the love of God dwelling in you. Though you search and quote scripture day after day, you have not that true love that comes before the Son and recognizes the Son, knows him, honors him. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Jesus Christ knew that Moses was the guru of this dispensation. So he's saying, don't be afraid. I will not accuse you to the Father. There is one who will accuse you, your very own guru. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words. If you cut yourselves off from the Guru Chila relationship 500, 1,000, 2,500 years ago, or with Maitreya in the garden, how will you expect to suddenly enter that relationship unless you change your attitude and bend the knee and confess that he is Lord and that Lord whom he is is in me? He said, you have not heard the word of the Father, you have heard the word of the Son. And he that heareth the Son heareth the Father. So the Father, the Lord God Almighty, has placed this initiation before us, that we recognize the incarnate Son in all who have gone before us, and ultimately recognize that Son as the Christ self within us, not by words, but by love. And you may recognize the Son in yourself, or the Son in, your, in the messenger, or in a fellow chila, or in Jesus Christ, or some distant guru. But if that recognition is not the daily work of love in honor, then you have not the true relationship. You have not eternal life, and you cannot be the instruments of healing. All of Jesus' words are for his children. If he rebuked the Sadducees and Pharisees for the denial of the Son, we ought to listen and see whether we have inherited some of the seeds of the wicked in their subtlety, and in some way, manner, shape, or form, we are now, in effect, denying the Son in a loved one, in our children, in a fellow chila, in any light bearers anywhere on the face of the earth. If we are limiting the fullness of the capacity of the Son of God to enter the temple of the child of light, if we ridicule the one soul becoming the Son of Man and say in our hearts, He is not worthy to receive the Son of God. Then you see we are beginning 
to be guilty because we have accepted the lie of the fallen ones. So healing begins with a healing of our vision, the clear vision and the clear seeing. And for that healing, we go to our blessed mother Mary, who has the immaculate vision, who holds the full authority and power of the all-seeing eye, so that at the same time we in discrimination may easily see dishonesty or selfishness or a problem of greed in someone. At the same time, the very same moment, we see the beauty of the soul. We love the soul in the state of becoming whole. We're willing to defend that soul unto the death from the carnal mind and its influences. We do not heap upon the soul the condemnation it has heaped upon itself through its own sin of dishonoring the Christ, but we magnify the Lord within the soul. When we say, my soul doth magnify the Lord, we're magnifying the Lord in our loved ones and in the whole family of God, affirming their opportunity to move toward the fullness of the incarnation. Unless we are doing that, we have somehow been tinged by the fallen ones and their lie. So it is not merely to affirm Jesus, 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 that he has become the fullness of the Christ. But what about all of his little ones? Merely to offend them is to incur the wrath of Almighty God. The offense of the little child in all people of all ages is the denial of the man-child in the heart. And you affirm that man-child no matter where you are or before whom you stand, people of light or darkness, because when you salute the man-child in the heart, the man-child manifests. And if it happens to be the seed of the wicked, that man-child comes into that heart for the judgment. And the man-child, the Son of God, will judge the unrighteous and the wicked. And you have not compromised your honor, but everywhere you go, you have affirmed that presence of the living Christ. Let us be particularly aware of the root of condemnation during the cycle of the full moon in Capricorn. It is the condemnation of the body of God, of America, and of the whole earth by the seed of the wicked. And there are plots moving in the minds of the wicked behind closed doors that affect the lives of Americans and freedom-loving peoples everywhere. These meetings are going on, and along with the condemnation of the forces of the accuser of the brethren who function as the false hierarchy under Capricorn, there is the intrigue and the treachery, perversion of the Holy Spirit. And there is the denial, the ultimate denial of the Son of God in the children of light in America. This is the excuse that the fallen ones always take for the destruction of the people. The people are expendable to the furtherance of their plans because the people do not have the living Christ within them. You have to first deny the Christ incarnate to be able to treat the people like cattle like animals and have individual life become worthless. So that is their philosophy. They have pervaded it among the masses. You see it in Asia in the slaughter of millions. It is the worthlessness of a single life pervaded by the seed of the wicked because they deny that that life is the potential to become the Christ. Without becoming that Christ, there are no works of the Father in the Son. And unless there be the works of the Father in the Son, there is no wholeness and no healing. Sons and daughters of God and children of the light, this is the great message of our healing retreat. Learn it, become it, put on the courage of righteousness of the Holy Spirit, be willing to stand before the adversary with this message, and you will see how God will witness through you by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother that you indeed are the one sent. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Mother, amen.